as hard as it's ever worked, all he gets back for his work is a D. And that there are, and that there is also a minority establishment. This is true not only of blacks but of minorities in general. Establishment which tells him, yes, uh, this is this is the racism on this campus, that uh, the, the the white power structure is trying to keep you down, and it has to have a certain plausibility to it. Uh, it would have had a certain plausibility to me uh, had I come along in that era. Now, I was fortunate enough in one sense that uh, having grown up in the South and then transferred to New York, I was shifted between different levels of uh, education. And so I was a top student in my class in uh, North Carolina. And then I was immediately the bottom student in my class in Harlem. And I was way behind whoever was next to the bottom because the, the educational differences were was, was just that great. Very painful period of adjustment. But it, but there was no racial issue involved since these were all the other kids who were ahead of me were all black, and so I got through that. And then for a second time in my life, uh, I'd gone out on my own when I was 17, and I didn't return to college full time until I was about 25. Uh, for the second time in my life, I sh went into an environment that was very difficult compared to what I'd been used to. And once again, I was way behind. I was in danger of flunking out of the school the first semester. Where were you then? Harvard. Uh, it's really, it really is incredible to. For the first time in your life, in 10 years, you're a full-time student, and you're a full-time student at Harvard without a high school diploma. Uh, <laughs> so there were little difficulties. And, and studying what? Uh, oh, at, for, uh, at that stage, I was studying uh, just general things, but I majored in economics, and all my, all my degrees were in economics. Um, and again, an enormous adjustment to make, but there was no one there to tell me, all these white professors have it in for you, and that's why you're doing badly. Because first of all, I had done badly in Harlem, and I'd overcome it. I was doing badly there, and I overcame it. But what happened at the you know, take that Harvard experience through? How long did you stay at Harvard? Well, I graduated. Graduated from Harvard. From I'm Harvard. sorry, I thought you said earlier you went to Howard. I went there for a year and a half, and then I transferred to Harvard. Oh, okay. See, all but right. I was going to Howard in the evening while working full time during the day. Uh, so, that, so when I went to Harvard, I was a full time student for the first time in ten years. And uh, so that that was that was. Uh, and what years did you go to Harvard? Remember, I graduated class of '58. Um, so that you can understand how the student would find this plausible. I talked to a black man recently, a lawyer, who said when he was in law school, he was told when he first got there that Professor X never gives black students more than a C. You know, and he got a B plus. But there was great consternation. Of course, one of the myths had fallen. But it's truly criminal what goes on in terms of using and manipulating the students uh, to serve all kinds of external purposes. Can you give us an idea of the kind of external purposes you're talking about? Oh, political purposes. I just, just a couple of days ago was told by someone from Wellesley that uh, there's a divestment uh, campaign at, at Wellesley, demonstrations, the whole thing. That those black girls who did not want to participate in that were threatened with violence, and that's not unique. At Stanford, uh, the Hispanic students, some Hispanic students, have complained that the Hispanic establishment has threatened them if they don't want to go along with what's being said and done, and they claim that uh, only 15% of the Hispanic students at Stanford have ever attended a single event sponsored by the Hispanic establishment which speaks boldly in their name. Uh, and so you have this kind of thing going on at, the, at these schools across the country. Again, notice that when, once you let in the students who cannot make, meet the academic standards, you're going to end up having to let in professors who can't meet the academic standards. And you're going to have to create courses that don't meet the academic standards. Correct me uh, on, the, on the names and everything. Derek Bell? <laughs> yes. Harvard Law School black man. Yes. Threatened the law school if they didn't hire a black woman. Yes, he's going. He's leaving. Well, no. Well, he's he's taking he's he's taking. Uh, if I understand it correctly, he's taking uh, unpaid leave until such time as they uh, uh, hire a uh, woman of color, as he says. Uh, but he's also said that by black he does not mean skin color. He means those who are really black, not those who are who think white and look black. And so what he's really saying is he wants ideological conformity in the people that, he, that are hired to fill this position. That's not uncommon either. Uh, I know a black woman, for example, who uh, she has a PhD. She's had a 
book published. She has another contract on another book. She's taught at a couple of very nice places. She has a devil of a time getting a job, not a job in a prestigious institution, a job teaching at a college. Uh, and the reason is that she gets shot down, blackballed, whatever, by people who don't like her ideology. That's happening not only racially, it's also happening even to where race is not an issue. Um, or law school, I learned recently, uh, there was a woman who was being considered for a 10-year position. And all the men voted for her and all the women voted against her because she does not follow radical feminism. And so you're getting these ideological tests so that at the very time that there's all this mouthing of the word diversity, there is this extremely narrow ideological conformity that's being enforced wherever people have the power to enforce it. What did you think of Derek Bell's whole plan? Well, every, every, his chances of success will depend upon whether or not he's overestimated his importance to the Harvard Law School. I think, I think, I think it would be a tragedy if, uh, if, if, if they caved in. And I, I was very pleased to see that they seem to show some backbone, which is quite rare among academics. Now, what do you think of the press treatment of him? He's been quite gentle. I mean, is uh, he a hero? To me? No, basically, I mean, from the press coverage you've seen, is he a hero to the... Well, he's, he's looked at as an idealist who is self-sacrificing and so on. I suppose one could have, if one wanted to look at it that way, see, have seen Hitler that way in his early days. Uh, it's just a question of uh, where that kind of idealism leads. He has launched a despicable attack on a young black professor at the law school who doesn't go along with this. A young man named Randall Kennedy who's written a very uh, thoughtful, intelligent article last June in the Harvard Law Review questioning some of the assumptions that people are making, people like Derek Bell, uh, and doing it in a very uh, gentlemanly as well as a very logical way, empirical way. And uh, that's not what they want. They want the conclusion to be that they want him to walk, march in lockstep, and he won't do it. And they're doing their best to make life impossible for him. What do you think Harvard will do? I've heard that, that Kennedy, and I don't know this, I've heard that he has tenure, and so I think that uh, he, he may be all right. But, I mean, what do, they, what do you think they'll do with Derek Bell? Yes. I hope that they will, re they will resist it. And since it's gotten so much publicity, I'm not sure they could stand to cave into it. Uh, I was very pleased to see that Alan Dershowitz at Harvard had criticized this, and then he picked up on the fact that what Bell is really asking for is not only that people be hired by race, but they be hired to fit Derek Bell's ideology. What would happen if uh, this was going on at Stanford Law School? They would have caved in long ago. Stanford Law School would have? Yes, I think so. It's a judgment call, but that's my judgment. Why would they do it so quickly? Just, to, just looking at their track record. Uh, I mean, they, they have perfected the technique of preemptive surrender. Now, given your, well, let me let me ask you about your politics. Uh, you we talked about the race issue, and what are your politics outside of the race issue? How would you describe your? Well, my, I, I always say that my political bias is that I'm biased against politics, and uh, I haven't been a registered member of any political party since 1972. Um, and I really am quite uh, disenchanted with politics of all sorts. Why? Well, I guess mainly just by following what they do and how they do it. That uh, they're really quite clever at the things they do, but the things they do really don't benefit the public very much. And that's not just race issues; all issues in general. What's it? Uh, has this changed over the years since you've been watching this whole thing? Uh, if it's changed, it's been for the worse. Um, I see some hopeful signs. People are trying to talk about limiting the terms of congressmen. Uh, I would like to see it, see it limited to one term. In other words, uh, if, you, if you're going to uh, allow a, a member of uh, the House of Representatives, for example, to spend four years in Washington, I would rather that they change that to one four-year term rather than two two-year terms, because the problem is re-election. And as long as they have to be re-elected and have to raise all that money, then they're going to sell out the public interest to get the money. It's really quite simple. You know, for example, an industry like the sugar industry can contribute money to Congress, and Congress will appropriate enough money to the sugar industry subsidies to pay, to pay them back $1,000 on every dollar. Now, you can't get that kind of return on your investment many places. And so there's no sign that they're going to stop doing that. 
that either they're going to stop offering the money or that the Congress is going to stop uh, giving the money. We were looking at the cover of your book, Preferential Policies, an International Perspective, published by Morrow. Thomas Sowell is our guest, and we have about 20 minutes left in our discussion. In history, who are your favorite, uh, not politicians necessarily, but who are